Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. This is such a great uh, special time to be with the church there in the Philippines. And we have so many uh, fond memories of being together and just being together with the original 28 that planted the church in 1989. But uh, I do want to give a welcome from the United States. I want to have, call my wife here, my better half, to also give a welcome. Magandang umaga po sa inyong lahat. Salamat po sa oportunidad na binigyan niya sa amin na makapiling namin kayong lahat. We are so grateful to be there last year and sana po makabalik makabalik po kami diyan kasi pamilya po namin kayo. So, salamat po uli sa opportunity na nabigyan niya sa amin na makapiling namin kayong lahat kahit na in the midst of all the pandemic. Salamat po at uh, talagang miss na miss namin kayo. Sana ay makarating din kayo dito sa amin pero sa ngayon Sana makarating uli kami dyan. Maraming salamat po. Thank you. I do want to bring greetings from the U.S. and uh, give a special uh, warm greeting to Coco and Frida, uh, Ariel and Susan, Roland and Wang, uh, Bobby and Susan, all the way in Cebu, uh, Dan and Gurley, uh, you know, just our hometown, the Gupan, uh, with Mon and Joel, Eric and Lisa, and our, my in-laws, Charisma and Arnie. Now there's so many, so many people that we'd want to greet. We, we would go on and on and on. But, uh, you know, we do want to just share our hearts today. We're honored to be able to share God's Word with you here today. You know, uh, after 34 years of being a disciple, you learn many lessons. We want to pass on a life lesson that has helped us survive through tough times, grow through long stretches, as a disciple and thrive in our later years. As I study Christ, although he is a creator of all things, intricate and complex, really when I think about Christ, Christ walked and lived a simplistic life. Sometimes we make it too complicated. You know, I wanna to start today with just some questions. Why are we here? Why do we do what we do? What makes us unique and special? Who we are today, what we do, and what makes us special boils down to a simplistic answer. The cross, the death, and the resurrection. This separates Jesus and all other philosophers, religious leaders, prophets, before and after him, and brings us significance. In short, what impact, what difference, what value do we receive from someone dying and rising to life in three days, some 2,000 years ago? With the coronavirus, and here in the U.S., you might have heard the, the racial turmoil that's going on. I, I do read a lot, and I listen to the news. And what can happen when I'm feeling at different times is that my heart could get numb to all the bad news. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 12, because of the increase in wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. It says in Luke 18, verse 8, however, however, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is sobering. Life and life's challenges have a way of chipping, chipping away at our faith. And so we need to grow in our knowledge and understanding of God. Over these past 34 years, one of the most powerful motivators, sustainers, is the answer to these questions. How does God view me? Do I have value? And do I have value in God's eyes? How do you put a price tag on how much it worth. Now let's look at the Bible here, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6 through 8. It says here, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possessions. As we know in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that we are chosen we're chosen people, holy people before the Lord. 
God saw, saw value in us. He purchased us to be his chosen possessions. You know, the title of my lesson here today is simply True Value. True Value. Because the love of most will grow cold, we need to arm ourselves with to be intentional, to feed our minds and our souls with wholesome thinking. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 8, right? It says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is praiseworthy, to think about such things. I have two simple points to guide us here today. The first point is, forge perceived value to equal true value. Let me say that again. Forge perceived value to equal true value. How we see what we perceive is important. Two people could look at the same situation and one sees value and the other sees tragedy. You know, this illustrative story, we've heard this maybe in the past, and it's a story, let me, let me share this story to kind of give us an idea of perceived value. There was a tale about two shoe salesmen who traveled to a third world country in search of new business opportunities. One man calls his wife the moment he lands, telling her, honey, I'm coming back home. There's no hope here. Nobody is wearing shoes. So there's no one to sell to. He boards the next flight home. The second man calls his wife and says, honey, you wouldn't believe what I found here. There's so much opportunity. No one here is wearing shoes. I could sell to the whole country. What's the difference? Perceived value. One saw it, the other one did not. Perceived value is crucial. The recent start stock market is influenced many times on perceived value. During the elections, wars, rumors, with the coronavirus recently, the values of stock has fluctuated up, up and down based upon perceived value. Typically, when you look at a product on the market, the price is set by the maker of that product. But ultimately, the buyer, what he's willing to pay, will determine its true value. For example, you could produce a, you could produce a painting, set the price, but the buyer will, will determine the true value, what they're willing to pay for. You could say it's worth a million dollars, but the, if they're not going to pay 10 pesos, what is it really worth? Let's do a quiz here, uh, a game show, really. What would you pay? I want you to look at these sneakers. Would you pay $500 for these used sneakers? Maybe smelly, maybe torn. Would you pay $500? What about now? You look at these sneakers. These were actually Michael Jordan's sneakers. At game five of, of the NBA uh, Finals, 1997, Michael Jordan gave his shoes to this uh, Utah Jazz ball boy. And, uh, you know, the, the, the ball boy took it. Someone act, actually offered him $11,000 in 1998, but he didn't sell it. Fifteen years later, it was sold for $104,000. Perceived value, right? These raw stones here, they were currency that once had value uh, for the Japanese about 500 AD. But would you keep these stones even in your living room? Can you imagine husbands? You know, you come home with this big stone. Hey, honey, look at this. Look at this. It has value, does it? What would you pay for these stones? For this stone in particular, would you pay a million dollars? Would you pay $10 million for this stone? This stone actually is the pink star. It was sold in April of 2017 for $71.2 million. 
It was the highest ever paid diamond. But you know, I'm curious, 2,000 years from now, what would these diamonds be worth? Maybe nothing. What would civilization value it then? Some of these we might think are stupid, crazy, or worthless, but, but value is in the eye of the beholder, what they are willing to pay for. What I want us to understand here is that God today, God is not only our, the maker, but is also the buyer. He created us. He's the maker. And so God determined the price set for our freedom. But uniquely, God is also our buyer and is willing to pay the price set, giving real, true value. What was the cost of our lives, our freedom, heaven? In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says that the wages, the cost of sin is what? Is death. That is what the price was set at. Who would be willing to pay this? Who would be willing to die for you? That's a sobering question when you think about it for a minute. Who would be willing to die for you? But a better question would be, who could pay this price even if they were willing? Only God, through Christ, who was a perfect sacrifice, could die for us. Parents, I want you to look at your kids for a minute. What price would you sell your kids for? Would you sell them for a million dollars? Ten million dollars? I don't know. I don't think any parent would probably sell their kids for that amount of money, right? All the money in the world. Let's look at a value scripture here. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 29 and 31. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, we know the story here. And Jesus is giving a parable. And he says here in Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. And even the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. You know, Jesus first establishes here that, that, that sparrows, of these birds, are kind of worthless, cheap. He says it's actually, you know, you get two sparrows for, for one penny. You know, that was maybe the first buy one, get one free, right? That two sparrows are worth less than, less than a penny, like half a penny. Yet even in, even in its worthlessness in the world's eyes, Jesus is saying here that if one sparrow falls down anywhere in the world, God would take notice of that. Because there's value in the sparrow. But God is saying, aren't you worth more than many sparrows? We have value in God's eyes. Let's look at another value scripture here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. And here, the Apostle Paul gives this value scripture, and he actually says it twice in 1 Corinthians 6, 19b, and also in, in 1 Corinthians 7, 23, really to, to get emphasis. He says here, in verse 6, or chapter 6, verse 19, Do you not know that your body is a temple? of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Here the scripture, Paul is saying that we were bought at a price. Let's look at another value scripture here. In John chapter 19, verse 30. And here we know this story. Jesus is now on the cross. And really, the, some of the last words that Jesus says when he's on the cross here. As he's hanging on the cross, he says, 
When he had received the drink, Jesus says, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. It is finished. In the Greek, uh, it is finished as titelestai. For example, this word here, it can be used like when you're making a final transaction or final payment on a car, it's paid in full. Here's your payment. This verb is in the present tense. It speaks of an action completed in the past, which results in continuing impact in the present. What a person pays determines the price. Titi lest I paid in full. The challenge for us is to strive to have the perceived value match the true value. We need to start with the true value from the scriptures. How does God value us here today? It's not emotional. It's real. True value is what someone already paid for. God bought us, that's past tense, at a price with Jesus. This is not opinion anymore, but this is fact. This will never change. That is set in stone value from God. That's our true value. Now, how do we view ourselves? That's our perceived value. That perceived value needs to, to rise up to match the true value that we have. But you might think here today, am I really worth it? You know, sometimes you can feel, you know, unworthy or or, or not really feel like, like you deserve things. Maybe you wouldn't even pay that price for yourself. Because we were bought, we belong to Christ. We have value, not because of who we are, but whose we are. Not who we are, but whose we are. We are God's children. We're God's child. Romans 8, 17 says we're actually co-heirs with Christ. Feel great about that. You know, our, my second point here is live as someone of value. Live your life. Be alive. Live as someone of value. We do work not to get value, but because we have value. It's a byproduct of who we are. But where can we have a tendency to get value? You know, especially in Asia, right? You know, you kind of work. There's things that we do to, to feel great about ourselves. I know how education is so important. But you think about the achievements, work, school, our grades. We could get it from our value from wealth, cars, homes, what we own. Maybe our relationships. I have a boyfriend, I have a girlfriend, I'm married. I'm, you know, we could get it from those things. We could get it from others' opinion of you or even our opinion of ourselves. How effective we are in reaching the lost, baptizing others. Maybe for you ministry leaders, you can get your value from how much you grow your ministry. I know that, that used to be something in the past, but I do praise God for all the things that are happening in Manila. That's really inspiring. But like, this, like the stock market, this perceived value can fluctuate, and our joy can be like a roller coaster up and down, depending on our performance. I want to cautious us, caution us not to devalue ourselves. Our boss, society, advertisements, friends, school, past upbringing, our spouse, our family, maybe abuses, past failures, Others' opinion of us or ourselves, our place in life, we could feel like I'm not enough. You know, the advertisements always say, you need to have this to be more. We could fall into sin. We think as we fall into sin that we could devalue ourselves. I'm not worthy. But how dare we devalue God's grace 
and his value for us. We just need to repent and get back up, right? Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 5, it says, while we were still sinners, that's when Christ died for us. Christ gave value when we were in sin. But do you know who the biggest one who tries to devalue us is? You probably guessed it. It's Satan. Satan is in the business of devaluing your self-worth. He wants to buy or purchase your soul at a discounted rate. Satan will try to whisper lies of less value. But we must be careful because when we see ourselves of less value, we give in to a cheapened life. We give in to taking shortcuts in life, settling for relationships that, that, that give you attention but maybe are ungodly, settling for not, settling for not taking care of yourself. Like, who cares type of attitude? Well, God cares. When we devalue ourselves and others, we can look down and get critical. See the worst in people instead of seeing value in others. You know, Oscar Wilde quoted, A cynic is a man who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. But there's only one person that could give Satan this full discounted rate. And that person is you, you yourself. I want us here to be confident and not worry because our value has been sealed. It's been guaranteed by the Holy Spirit. You know, in Ephesians chapter one, let's read here. I love this scripture because it, it brings us a confidence in our lives to be who we need to be and, and do what we need to do and to be excited about these things. In Galatians chapter, excuse me, Ephesians chapter one, it says here in verse 13, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is a seal. This promised Holy Spirit, we're marked for this deposit guaranteeing our salvation until the redemption that we're going to receive. You know, the definition of redemption is the action of gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt to be redeemed. Our challenge here today is to capture our true value, our true value. To capture our true value. Albert Einstein, one of the smartest men in the world that ever lived, said, try not to be a man of success but a man of value. Even the world's thinking understands value. We need to think, ponder, study, embrace. To think, ponder, study, embrace what our value is. Practically, I really want to encourage us to be intentional to pass this value on to others. To share your life and faith. To study the Bible to continue to study the Bible with our spouse, our kids, our friends, our neighbors, our classmates. Because as we share this value with others, it becomes more real for us here today as well. We have the value that the world is longing for. Every one of us that are disciples today, we have value to give because this value is from God. Even with life's most challenging situations, we have value with God because God gives us value. You know, I want to share just a, a story that happened with me recently. Like I mentioned earlier, I've been a disciple for over 34 years. But these past four, three years ago was probably one of the hardest 
times of my life as a disciple. It's the first time that I've ever had hatred, that I had a fit of rage as a disciple. You would think that after all these years go by, life is smooth and life is easy and you just kind of go on. But, but you know, something really tragic happened in our life about three years ago. There, my daughter, and I, you know, I asked her if I could share about this. Uh, Alexa, some of you guys uh, may have remembered Alexa. We left it when uh, she was five years old. She was born in the Philippines. There was a, a man in the church that uh, really um, hurt our daughter and really kind of pulled her away from the church. And when that had happened, uh, he was a brother in the church. It, it just broke and tore my heart apart. And uh, it was a rough time for her whole family. And I remember at that time when, when my daughter left the church, she just, she just left the church. I said, you know, what value, what right do I have to continue to lead this church? when I can't even look at my own life and, and be an example. And I remember talking to, some of you might know Frank Kim, he's an elder in the church in Denver. And Frank said to me, he said, you know, brother, if God wants to take you out of the ministry, he'll take you out, but don't take yourself out. You know, Frank really looked at me with value and said that there's something in me, don't give up. And so based on that, I, I just hung on to Frank's faith in some ways and, and believed what he said about me, even though I didn't really see it myself. And then I realized, you know what? If God, maybe God wants to create a miracle here, but if I give up now, I'll never see that miracle. So I stayed faithful. I stayed uh, faithful as a church leader. My, my daughter had left. But in time, she's, she wanted to start coming back to church. And just kind of cut the story short. One day she was driving on the highway, going about 75, 80 miles an hour in a 75 mile zone. And a truck pushed her off the side of the road. And at 80 miles an hour, her car flipped over with her best friend three times. When we got to the scene, the emergency, the ambulance already taken her away. They looked at us and they said, the, the police said, somebody should have died tonight. We went to the emergency room and we saw our daughter there. And as we looked at Alexa, she just saw us and started weeping, crying. And she said, mom and dad, I, I gave everything up and I, I want to make Jesus Lord of my life again. She told us later on that she said, as her car was spinning upside down and it was, cr it was crushed, all she could think about was, am I right with God? Am I right with God? She knew that everything is meaningless unless we're right with God. And she made that, she made that decision to go back to God. What a miracle. When they examined her, her body and her best friend, there was not a broken bone, no bruising internally. All they had was her best friend had a little cut on her toe and they put a band-aid, that was it. It was, a, it was a total miracle from God. I share that because somebody helped me to have value in myself once again, or, or to see the value from within that I really had from God. I want to really encourage us all to give this value to a desperate world. You know, Warren Buffett, of all people, says that prize is what you pay, value is what you get. We have something to give to people. This deal became real and valuable and available when Jesus died and rose from the dead. If Jesus never rose from the dead, this deal would be worthless because Satan would have, would have won the victory. But when did we receive this value? We received this value when we made Jesus Lord and were baptized, amen? We sealed the deal when we were baptized into Christ. 
You know, John chapter 3, verse 1 through 8, it talks about being reborn. It talks about a new birth. And actually at that time, when we're reborn into Christ, our spiritual DNA changes. Because the Holy Spirit of God lives now within us. And the Spirit is powerful. And the Spirit, the Bible says, it's like the wind that blows and it, and it just goes wherever it wants to go. So is everyone that's born of the Spirit. We need to allow the Spirit within us to take us on a crazy journey, just, just to go for it. The Spirit of God is within us. You know, this book that I read a while back, it's called Jesus Manifesto. And it says here, this quote, if Christ is in you, then the Christian life is not about striving to be something you are not. It is becoming what you already are. You know, as I have captured the Spirit of God, and you know, the, the last few years we've been praying for just crazy prayers. God, do amazing things. One of the crazy prayers that we prayed was we didn't have a we didn't have a Bible talk on the Air Force Academy. So the Air Force Academy is one of the premier uh, colleges in the United States. This is where all the future leaders, West Point, the Air Force Academy. This is where they're all the, the presidents of our company, of, of our country, the generals, they come from these schools. We pray, God, please start a, a Bible talk here. And as we made that prayer, a crazy prayer, because we didn't have one there, we get a call from a, a colonel all the way back east who's a disciple. Two months later, he says, I'm being transferred to the Air Force Academy. We start a Bible talk there. We baptize some people in Christ, and now we have a thriving Bible talk at the Air Force Academy. Every Monday, there's about 20 to 30 Air Force cadets that come to this, to this academy, Bible talk. What's amazing, though, is our very first convert, uh, he was a football player, baptized into Christ, and then Alexa got restored and started leading together. And uh, over the last year and a few months, uh, they've been dating in Christ. And they're pretty serious. They, they really love each other a lot. But I just look at that and I say, wow, that, that is a miracle from God. God could do amazing things. I want to end up by just saying this. I want to give a challenge to the campus and the singles. It's time to continue to dream big and crazy dreams. You are the future of our churches. You will define Christianity for our churches as time goes on, as the years go on. But I want you to think, what crazy thing could God do in our lives today? As the Spirit moves, let it go. For the older disciples, those that have been around the, the 20 to 30 years, I know you're there, I'm looking at you. I'm just like you. I want to say this. I'm 56. Uh, we'll be 57. Kit will be, Sita Kit will be 57 next week. We believe that our best days are still coming. And I want to challenge all the, the old, the, 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 uh, the foundational people of the church to say, you know what? My best days are yet to come. And to really seek from God. God, how are you going to use me in these next days to come? Talk it over with your disciple. Pray about it. Ask your Bible talk leader. Ask your church leader, how can I be used now? These are crazy times we live in. What's the future hold for us? You know, in this book, Jesus Manifest, I want to read this quote. It says, to the person who walks in the Spirit, paradox, mystery, and uncertainty propel him forward instead of bogging him down. Where is the Spirit of God leading you today? I'm going to leave us with these questions. How much are you worth? How much are you worth in God's eyes? Priceless? No. How much are you worth? You are worth Jesus. True value. 
Brothers and sisters, it's so great to be together. I, I, I hope that we could uh, communicate some more. Uh, we love you, and our hearts are, are still in the Philippines. We, we hope and dream one day to, to be united uh, in the Philippines with you. Maraming salamat. We love you. Have a great worship. Amen.